line has got a question for Jonathan about Medicare. Go ahead, Fred. What's your question? <laughs> ah. I, I, I really do have a question for John. Yeah, go right ahead, Fred. Albert, go right ahead. <laughs> okay. I get calls all the time uh, from someone um, that sounds like they're from a, a, a different place, a different country perhaps, uh, telling me or asking me questions about Medicare. And I just normally politely say, I, you know, I, I, I'm okay, and and hang up. Um, is that what I should do? <laughs> yes, yes. You're you're a better person than I am. I usually make fun of them and have have fun with them on the phone. Um, yeah, it well, definitely I, is. There are these international call centers a lot in the Philippines, India, South America, um, and they're just they're they're the calls are illegal at this point. They're not supposed mm-hmm. to be making those calls, but they get around it. They're not here in America. And then they, they yeah. funnel stuff to unscrupulous agents who buy these uh, leads that they create. And it's just you don't want to get taken advantage of by the call centers. Best thing. Well, some, something told me that was, the, that was the right thing to do was just to politely excuse myself and hang up. <laughs> do you remember those, uh, what was the extended car warranty calls that were the big thing of about a year ago? Yeah, they so? dried up. Oh. They're gone. I don't get those yeah. anymore. I, I, used, sh- I used to get them and they'd say, do you have an older, uh, or what, what year are your cars? And I'd say, I've got a, uh, got a, a 2002 uh, Ferrari. I need to get insured. Uh, can you help me with that? <laughs> I've just oh, yeah. made a couple of all these really ridiculous yeah, one of the, things. One of the new ones was the, uh, the car accident thing. Uh, you were in a car accident in the last 12 months. <laughs> How did you know that? That's amazing. I was in it three days ago. Are you calling from my lawyer's office? This is great. How can, I'm, I'm here. Can I, can I give you my social security number so you can look me up? Here's my routing number on my, oh, my checking goodness. account. Yeah. Uh, Fred, let's uh, let's talk uh, a couple of pieces of legislation that uh, have moved through, and one is teacher carry. We had uh, Dale Leon and got his opinion about that recently too. I'd like to hear yours in regards to teacher carry becoming the law. Not that it is yet in uh, West Virginia. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be on your call. Thank you for inviting me. I will start out by saying we have 12 days left of this legislative session. And yes, I am counting every day. But uh, so I, t- I spoke with Dale yesterday. We we're at the Capitol every day. Many times we are together uh, on in committee meetings. But you know, I'll just say this: we don't need more guns in our schools. And I personally don't think this is the way we should be going. Uh, I know that in AFT West Virginia, we have members on both sides of this issue. But now that the law has changed, uh, just by some wording, uh, an amendment was adopted the other day, last week, on the House floor, and then it did pass uh, the House. It goes to the Senate. Um, But what disturbs me about this bill is that counties, and, and, you know, we talk about local control all the time. The counties now have been taken out of this because there's one word, that changed and that changed from may to shall so if if a teacher or and it's not just teachers it's any school employee uh, agrees to be the concealed carrier to protect the school um, and if they pass the background test and go through the 24-hour training which i personally don't think is enough um, they shall be allowed to carry and the county nor the state superintendent cannot override that so that's concerning to me Um, of course we want our students to be kept safe we want our employees to be kept safe but I'm not so sure that this is the route that we should be going especially when last year in house education we had a retired police captain who came and spoke to the committee and said, please don't do this. This should not be put on our educators to to carry this burden of of doing this. So um, I I think it's very troubling, and um, hopefully when it goes uh, to the Senate before they vote, more level heads will prevail and, and it will be defeated. What are you hearing in regards to the Senate's attitude toward this specific bill, Fred? 
Well, I've heard, you know, both comments, but I I just think we might have some hope there because I I think here are some other things in this bill that concern me. Let's say that an educator or, um, you know, a a custodian um, agrees to be the concealed carry person. What happens when that person who should have this um, gun concealed on them at all times um, what it, what happens when they go on a field trip? Uh, let's say to the state culture center. I don't think where you're allowed to have guns in there, but would that person be allowed to conceal carry that gun in the culture center? And what do they do with the gun if, if they're not? I mean, I th- I just think there's some unanswered questions that uh, will uh, you know present un- unintended consequences. Fred, do they allow concealed carry in the Capitol? No. So if you're in the House of Delegates and you're, you have a concealed carry, you have to leave your gun in your vehicle or someplace else before you enter? That's my understanding, yes. Interesting. Mr. Gilstrap. Yeah, yeah good morning, Fred. Uh, good morning. A, a couple of things here. Um, first of all, why is the shall... I've heard this a couple of times now, as opposed to May. And as I understand it, it said if if somebody in West Virginia, constitutional carry state, is has the right to carry a firearm anywhere except in schools and some other places, but then if he goes through or she goes through all of these these different qualifications, then mm-hmm. they will be able to protect themselves and 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 have their their second amendment rights preserved in the school what are the circumstances where where the county should be able to say no on that if it was may instead of shall how did what is what are you foreseeing well you know i think the county knows their employees well they should know uh, the stability of their employees the the character of their employees in many cases but it takes all of that away because uh, – and, and maybe counties don't know everything that they maybe should know about their employees, but it's just it, – this removes the county from being able to do anything because it says they shall be caring instead of they may. The may would say – you know, the county would say, well, we don't, we don't really want this in our county. We don't, we don't want – and that that was how it changed. The counties would have the option previously to allow uh, concealed carry employees. Well, it, now it, they shall they shall do it. They have to do it. Well, and to be clear, the shall does not say that the teacher shall carry. It says that the the administration shall not keep them from doing so. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay. So let me yeah. ask you this then. Here's here's the hypothetical uh-huh. and. You talk about going to the cultural center or something like that. Okay, fine. Uh, those are details to be worked out. But if you put yourself in the, in the situation where you are a, a math teacher and, you know, the bad guy always gets the first shot. It, it just It's the way in every shooting incident, the bad guy always gets the first shot. So this bad guy shows up at your door and points a gun at your students and is going to kill them. Wouldn't you kind of want to be able to take out the bad guy before he opened fire on the kids in the classroom? Absolutely. Then Absolutely. where's the problem but, with the rule? But here's the thing. There, it, it's, it's more complicated than that. If I'm the cons- moment, my, not, not at that one, moment, it's not. At that moment, that's exactly well, what the incident is. Well, but at that moment also, uh, perhaps the, the person, the perpetrator that's coming to my door um, – could be a former student you know as as the police captain said to the house education committee each each call that he answered it's always different and you always of of course face that call with a certain amount of anxiety or or you don't know what's going to happen but let's say that this the person appearing at my door with my students inside is a former student and many times that has been the case in these school shootings. My mind, I don't know, I don't know how I would be thinking, and, and God forbid that I would ever have to face that situation, but could I pull a 
gun on a former student. I, I, I just, there's so many things that when I became a teacher, uh, it was a different time, of course, and we had different situations, but I wasn't trained for that. And I'm not sure that 24 hours of training would give me the confidence to do that. And who's doing that training? I thought it was going to be done by um, the Homeland Security people, but now I'm hearing that it's going to be done by the local police departments. So I, I just there there's too many burdens with this bill that I don't think uh, should be placed upon our educators or our school employees. Fred, I got a, I got a lot of points here. Um, let me just start off. You've used the word burden a few times. It's not like they're going to walk into the school and say, okay, you, you, and you, you're the gun people. Go take the class. The people who are going to do it, it is their choice. They have the choice to want to be the person carrying the gun to protect the children. And are you saying if it's a former student with a gun, I mean, obviously, they have a gun. They're ready to shoot current students. That should not enter into it. The other thing that I that I really found strange that you said was, you know, the school system knows about the stability and the character of the people working there. Don't we want people with stability and character working there? Do we I mean if you if you have people who have no stability and have no character, do we not push them out the door? Does do school systems keep them there working? I hope that they don't. Of course not. Uh, of course we wouldn't want that. But there could be situations where someone is you know, experiencing medical issues, or I, I don't know, but I'm just saying I think it should be left up to the county as to whether or not they want to participate in this uh, issue. The, the, Our guest, by the way, Fred Albert, is the president of the American Federation of Teachers, West Virginia. Was that have you John polled? Was that? Have you polled any uh, superintendents? Have you talked with any county superintendents? Have you heard of any super, county superintendents that are, are dead set against this? Anecdotally, I have uh, spoken with some county superintendents who are against it. Yes. The other issue is who's going to bear the liability of uh, the insurance? I'm sure that someone would have to be covered maybe a little bit more heavily with insurance what if you know what if someone is accidentally shot and and the other another issue that i think of okay i'm the i'm the volunteer school protector and we have a code red or whatever the code in the school might be that we have an active shooter on campus and i'm called into duty to go protect our students and other employees does that mean i leave my classroom with my students unattended i go out into the hall uh with a gun and if law enforcement then has been called and they show up and i'm standing there with a gun and they're from a distance from me you know all school employees should have uh, a badge that shows identification that they're a school employee but Am I going to be shot because I'm standing there with a gun and they don't they can't see my identification or they don't know that I'm the actually uh, the the concealed carry person in the building? Has that been thought about? I don't know. Well, the, and you know the the argument that well we know that the only way to take care of a bad guy with a, a gun is a to have a good guy with a gun. Tell that to the parents in Uvalde, Texas. Tell that to these. Uh, people in Kansas City last week, uh, when there, I understood quite a few people with guns around, and that one perpetrator was still able to kill a person and injure 22 other people. Fred, I want to move on to another topic because we could clearly do you know 10, 20, 30 more minutes on this uh, subject here. <laughs> yes, we could. But then we wouldn't get to anything else. Uh, first and foremost on that list is the House recently took a vote to. Uh, extend eg religious uh, exemptions for vaccinations, mandatory vaccinations in all schools. It hasn't gone through the Senate yet, but it would include public schools too. Is there an official position that the AFT has on vaccinations in schools? Well, we that just happened, I believe, yesterday after a two-hour debate. So we will be discussing that with members, and we'll be discuss we do a legislative update each week. We do a, a Zoom with our local presidents, so I'm sure we'll have 
an opportunity to get their thoughts on this. But, you know, that's one thing West Virginia leads the nation in. We're number one, from what I've heard. I just heard minority uh, leader uh, Sean Hornbuckle, Delegate Sean Hornbuckle from Cabell County, speak to this. Uh, We lead the nation in childhood immunization, and we've done a good job. Excuse me. We've done a, a really good job with that. Uh, I, I don't know why we want to go down that path, you know, because now the way the bill is, after a two-hour debate on the floor yesterday on this particular bill, um, you could just write a letter. If you don't want your child to be immunized, uh, you could write a letter and say, I have religious objections, and that's that's acceptable. Um I think this bill started, of course, you you probably already know this, it was a bill to uh, exempt uh, virtual school students from having to be uh, vaccinated. But now it's grown to, even in our public schools, if someone objects, um, all they'd have to do is write a letter and say, I have religious reasons that I don't want my child to be immunized. I think that puts other children... Uh, at risk. And we see that this is happening in some states. Uh, It's not an epidemic yet, but I've read that in one classroom in Florida, uh, six of the eight cases that have been reported of measles has occurred in one classroom. Do we really want to go back to having measles and chicken pox and and all of those childhood um, issues? I, I don't think so. So why do we why do we want to go there? I think measles is currently being reported in 12 states uh, around the country. Fred, do teachers have to be vaccinated to get employed in West Virginia as a, as a teacher in a public school? Do they have to be vaccinated for measles, mumps, rubella, that, that sort of stuff? Uh, you know, that's a very good question, and I'm not sure. I, I would th- I think so. I know one time we had to be vaccinated for TB. That has no longer been an issue, but we had to be tested every three years or I forget what that was, but I do remember doing that, and you had to have a card to prove that you'd been uh, vaccinated for against TB. Um, I don't remember that being a condition of employment, but I would assume that most people were. If I was a and teacher, I, know you shouldn't I assume anything, but if I was a teacher, I would want all the vaccines being around all those little germ factories, but it would be my choice. <laughs> right, uh, exactly. Frederick, because, you know. It does happen. In regards to pay raises for this year, what's the latest that you are hearing? Well, uh, I've heard several things. You know, we we were really appreciative of, of course, what the governor offered, um, but we were most appreciative of what was offered in the House. There were two bills. There was one bill for our school service personnel, which would have provided them with a substantial raise of about $6,700 more a year. And we know our service personnel, the backbone of our schools, bus drivers, cooks, custodians, uh, we couldn't, teachers couldn't do what they do without our service personnel. I'm going to tell you that. But um, that bill looks like it's stalled. Um, There was another bill for teachers that would provide, um, it would raise the beginning teacher salary, uh, and it would have provided about $5,000 more a year for our uh, educators, our teachers. Those uh, have stalled in house finance, from my understanding. I think the uh, the governor's bill, which would be another five percent, and that's a five percent on the average. That's not a five percent of each individual salary, uh, which would be about a hundred and forty some dollars more a month for our service uh, personnel, and about uh, twenty four hundred dollars for teachers. That. Um, That is in the finance, Senate finance, I believe. So it hasn't passed yet, but there's still some hope. Have you been given an indication of what the next PEIA premium increase will be? Oh, yes. For the next year, it will be 10.5%, according to the, you know, the last vote that was taken by the finance board in January. Um, It should be 10.5% next year. So... That will mean within two years we've had over a 34% increase 
in PEIA premiums. Fred, would AFT support local control of teacher salary? Let it be decided county by county. Well, you know, local, we do support the fact that local boards can also give a a supplemental pay raise, um, which would help in their particular county. So local school boards have that authority to do that now. Unlimited the amount extra they they can can give? Pardon? Is it unlimited the amount of extra they can give, or is it limited a limited amount? No. I do not believe it's limited. I believe it was would be at the will of whatever the school local school board could afford. So are you saying that Jefferson County and Berkeley County could be unilaterally paying their teachers more than they are now? They actually do pay a supplement to teachers in Berkeley County. But to bring it up to a competitive level, if that's what they wanted to do. It's it's that's, more than what the state be, payroll is, but yeah. it's it's not enough to just a couple Hager's grand team. more though. Yeah. But in theory, if the revenue is available, they could pay the same that that Loudoun County is paying. They could. Yeah, that's correct. You know, for many years, Boone County, uh, because of the coal severance tax, Boone County teachers made more than Kanawha County school teachers made, because they had a they had the severance tax on coal there. That brought in uh, more revenue to that county, so that county uh, supplement to the state uh, funding would uh, pay those the teachers in Boone County more. Fred, uh, about a minute so left. Had, Final thought is yours. Go right ahead, sir. Final thought is mine. I just I wish that we were really working uh, diligently to bring more teachers into this profession, and and when we pass things like the concealed carry. Um, for educators, I know that's very controversial. I wonder how many uh, young teachers that is keeping away or how many young people that's keeping away from going into this profession. We, we need to, and you've heard me say this before, we need to do more to lift up this profession and to respect this profession and to give the freedom to our teachers to teach what they have been trained to do. Um, and all of these bills that are, you know, kind of taking the, that respect away, uh, I think that hurts our profession. It doesn't help it. Same thing with our service personnel. We really need to get behind our service personnel and support them, uh, show them that, you know, they're, they're worth a, a decent living, decent salaries, uh, affordable health care. Those are the things that we need to do to promote our uh, profession more. Fred, always good to have you on the program. Thank you so much for your time today. Well, I appreciate you, and and thank you for the service that you provide. And John G. and John B., it's always nice to talk with you. So have a great rest of the day. I'm headed into the Capitol now. Yes, sir. Thanks, Fred. Have a good one.